Welcome, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Andres Jaque. I'm the Dean of Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And it's, it's such an honor and a, a joy to, to uh, open this, this event today uh, to discuss and to celebrate this amazing book that many of you have been reading, uh, New York Global Critical Writings and Proposals, 1970-2020 by Richard Plant. And an introduction to an event to discuss the work of Professor Richard Plant can only start by acknowledging that he is unquestionably a worldwide leading authority on housing and urban development. In these buildings, it is relevant to note that Professor Plant started teaching at Columbia in 1974, when the school was still called the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning and was processing the effects of the 1968 protests. In the book, The Making of an Architect, 19, uh, sorry, 1881, 1980, uh, 1981, Richard, alongside uh, Martha Goodman, your very, uh, very long-term colleague and friend, published a piece called Anatomy of Insurrection. There, they said, the students in 1968 focus on the contradictions within the profession and school within the profession and school which had existed since their inception, most basically between responsibility to fulfill needs related to the welfare of the society as a whole and survival within the constraints of the American economic system. For a school of architecture in New York City, they, they said, the issue of defining social purpose is more immediate than for schools located in more idyllic settings. As the American metropolis, New York has harbored the most pervasive forms of wealth and poverty. This is probably even more true now than, than there, or even more. And that's something that is very relevant to the work of Richard and Martha as well, but, but now we're talking about Richard. At a time when the world is facing a huge housing crisis with 1.8 billion people globally who do not have adequate housing and 150 million more across the world living in homelessness, Professor Plant's voice is one to be heard. From 1992 to, nine, to 2015, Richard served as the director of the Master of Science in Urban Design Program. In 2005, he founded the Urban Design Lab, which provides research and pedagogical opportunities for collaboration between Columbia's Earth Institute, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and the Full Foundation, the School of Engineering and Applied Science. In January 2023, and of course this is just a few things because there would be 20 more to be added here. In January 2023, Richard Plant was named Professor Emeritus at GISA. 50 years from when he first came to Columbia, Richard is presenting his new book, New, Global, new York Global Critical Writings and Proposals, 1970-2020. It is a book that was made mostly in parallel to his journey as Columbia professor and provides a retrospective reflection of the intellectual and political project that defined his trajectory. The book gives a detailed account. I mean, I'm sure many of you have enjoyed this book. It seems so relevant now. I think this is a book that definitely it's setting a discussion that we need to have and providing information to have it informed uh, in an informed way. The book gives a detailed account of how since, 19, since the 1970s, social inequality and climate crisis became inseparable from architecture and urban design, and the unavoidable reality in which architecture and urban design operated. In Richard's case, this has also been a pedagogical project anchored in the specific knowledge of architecture and, archi and urban design. Richard has built interdisciplinary alliances, practices, institutions, and he has committed to communi community engagement around the world Actually, I remember when I first came to Columbia, your lottery presentations were actually lectures uh, that would show us basically how you were connecting actually with these communities, working with them, repeating uh, uh, the work that you did previous years with them, connecting them with things that were, you were also developing in other parts of the university. This book adds to a highly proliferous production of researchers and scholars that includes Richard's work as A History of Housing in New York, 1990, who could miss that book? Uh, it's a book that is a reference in housing. It's, it helped probably all of us here to understand 
all the struggle to, 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 to promote social justice through housing and to challenge it. We learn how racialization happened through housing, but also how many experiments were trying to were, were intended to challenge that. And that richness is something that probably all of us have read in the city uh, through Richard's book. I remember to have visited parts of Bronx that I had never been to, or Queens, uh, with your book in my hand, trying to find the buildings that you were talking about, the sculptures that were introducing the garden apartments and, 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 and finding that they, they existed, that those communities were there. Two Adirurak's hamlets in history, Keene and Keene Valley, uh, Chitik Riffs, Urbanism, Ecology Plays with Lars Muller, and you also have been the editor of Housing Form and Public Policy in the United States, the Urban Life Work, Formation, Perception, Representation, Eco Guanus, Urban Remediation by Design, Urban Climate Change Crossroad. I'm very happy that today we can discuss New, New York Global, a book that is at the same time an account of Richard's reflections as an architect, as a researcher, as a teacher, as a colleague, and most important, or, or, or something that is inseparable from all the above, a citizen. And that's something that I remember Reinhold keep reminding us how important it is to be what we do and also being doing that as a citizen. It's my pleasure to open this session uh, full of people that know a lot about your work, Richard, and have, that have been influenced by your work. Um, this opening will be followed by Richard's words and then by Mary McLeod that will also be intervening. And then uh, we will all engage in a conversation with Kate Asher, the Paul Milstern Professor of Professional Practice at GSAP, Michael Bell, Professor of Architecture at GSAP, uh, 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 Adam Lubinsky, Associate Professor of Professional Practice, uh, Reinhold Martin, Professor of Architecture and the Chair of the Commun Columbia University Committee of Global Thought, and Mary McLeod that will join us after his, her uh, introduction. Uh, so please join me welcoming Richard Plants. Okay, thank you, Andres. Andres has always been very interested and supportive of my work. Um, and I, I always thought, you know, I had this idea that architecture could be more than what it was when I studied in a polytechnic and, you know, and, and things were going to change and they've certainly changed. Um, and I've always been interested in, in, in Andre's take on that change. Which, uh, so, so I appreciate a lot your, your words. Um, I thought we would like have a small group of, of faculty and sit around, discuss this book kind of BS. And I, I, I mean, there's so many faces here that, this is like Twilight Zone, actually. I, I don't know. Like, so I'm going to try my best to to uh, uh, to deal with this. Uh, I uh, I put together uh, quite a few slides, as always, but I will go quickly, and then we can go back to things that are of particular interest. But I I thought um, well, I had to reread the book several times, and then I thought maybe some important issues were the mutations relative to the studios that were taught. Um, the advocacy component. I never taught a studio without a client, I think. And I taught 68 studios, I believe. Maybe it was 78. Uh, 78 studios and 68 um, seminars. And uh, the question of history, because I've always been interested in history and, uh, and then Language, cognition, urban cognition, which has, of course, evolved tremendously since I first thought about it back in um, uh, 1967. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of stuff relative to these questions, and then we'll, we will um, then we'll do whatever we're going to do. Here. So this, here they are. Yeah, 78 and 69. Uh, there was a lot of, exp <laughs> you know, it was all kind of fun. You know, some were more fun than others, especially for the students, I suppose. But you guys can fill me in on that. Um, there were some interesting ones. I think the joint 
architecture engineering students were very interesting. You know, and I did seen of those. I thought I, I didn't know I did that many. Uh, and toward the end, there were the architecture planning studios. Um, and it always seemed to me that this was the way to go, that we can't just talk to each other. Uh, even, even as professional, you know, even in professional education, especially now. Um, and then there were all these research seminars, all usually had clients. They had something to do with somebody somewhere with a problem. Um, and they usually, you know, they would find out and they'd come and ask, can you come here and do this or that? Um, and whenever we could, I would, we would go. No, I'm going. Um, then there were three, uh, I think, three important things to mention from the very beginning. Uh, Lefebvre, of course, uh, and his ideas about praxis and how urban, how urban practice was going to be a new discipline and how uh, praxis itself was evolving. So whatever I thought about, I mean, this is back you know, in the 60s, um, he published, published that book called Explosion. It was 1969, I think. Uh, then there's the question of participation. That is, who's the architect and who's the client? And how do these things, how should these things get mixed up? That, of course, was De Carlo, Giancarlo De Carlo. Uh, who wrote the first very polemic uh, essay on the question that he called it participation. Um, and he asked for a mutation between architect and client. Uh, and then there was the history question, which, which, as I said, interested me a great deal, but not history as to, uh, Tafuri said, not history as object, history as problematic somehow, right? And that was also, uh, very important to me, and especially in the first like 20 years or so, I was very involved with writing history of the environments that we, you know, studied. Um, the politics, yes, I have to say, and, and the first essay is Vietnam. It's a kind of a cre it's a kind of crude essay, but I really wanted to put that in there. Uh, it was very passionate. It got me into a lot of trouble. Um, uh, af right after Kent State, of course, I was at Penn State, so you know, 90 minutes away, the students were killed um, by our own military, and so of course the war came home, and this was extremely important, and I tried to connect this somehow to the larger picture, especially in our cities, of what was happening. Um, and then we wrote this statement um, to the university and to the government. There, there, there was a kind of meeting, and I gave that talk, uh, whatever it was, and there were strange men there in suits and ties taking pictures. And I never did do a FOIA request, but I'm sure there's something somewhere. <laughs> and it got me into a lot of trouble at Penn State. So here I am, <laughs> 50 years later <laughs> at, uh, at Columbia. Mutations. These are just uh, quotes. Whoops, from the from the book, and uh, this just has to do with the idea that, of course, the studio is an amazing research like uh, vehicle. I mean, you have you have these great minds. You have the possibility of thinking and saying things without, you know, without recourse. Um, and uh, and so I always believed in. A studio should have a product, it should be coherent, and it should address someone's problem somewhere, so I, I mentioned. This starts in Penn State. Uh, there were other things at Penn State, but the mantra primer had to do with, uh, the mantra work had to do with this new uh, vision of a studio. We, um, we bought a, we had a house in Mantua. We lived there for a year. It was abandoned. We, fixed it up. George, were you ever there? I think you, no, you didn't go there. Um, I was, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure that house is there anymore. That was 432 North 38th Street, in case anybody's from Philly. <laughs> and um, 
Um, Mantua was uh, arguably, but I think, uh, you know, the most violent um, place in the East Coast, for sure. Um, and we found that to be very exciting because we could, of course, try to understand um, the structure of the place, the, um, you know, the causes and effects. And we did a very early modeling, which I'll come to later. Uh, and then we moved from Mantua, that was two years. Uh, we did the report with the public health service, so there was a, a lot of government interest in what we were doing. Nobody else was doing this stuff, so of course the government was interested. Then we moved to San Leocho in, in, in outside of Naples in Italy, um, and that became a very long-term project. George was there. <laughs> Who else was there? I don't know if any, no, I don't think so. Well, we're survivors. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we worked there intensively for three years, did a report um, of that work, rather extensive report, uh, in English, and it was only last fall republished in Italian, finally. Um, and we, uh, uh, there was a big party <laughs> in uh, San Leocho. Um, and that, that's the new report. It's a complicated story, but uh, it's in English, and there's a copy in Avery as well. Here is the final event. Um, and, uh, and then... 50 years later, uh, full disclosure, that is me. And then the, the newspaper wanted to know what I look like now, and I hesitated, but anyway. <laughs> and here we are, the October 26th, 2016. several of the Pensley Chiefs, uh, Michael and Tim here, they actually came. Uh, this is one of the young people in the town at that time. Here's, here are some of the Pensley Chiefs who joined the right room, including George there. Um, so 50 years. And to me, 50 years, you know, that's a about right, probably. I mean, uh, the problem with these normal studios is you come and go and it goes in the wastebasket. And I, I, I was always very, very, uh, you know, critical of that phenomenon. And, uh, you know, it's a generalization. It doesn't always work that way, but it's a tendency. Okay. And then Colombia GSAP comes to San Leocho here. The following, so the following year, um, uh, I started the Turkey Project. Turkey Project, I have some notes here, but if I read the notes, it's going to take too long. The Turkey Project starts in 74 and ends in 2016 with the final publication of that report. And we made uh, field visits in 74, 86. David, you were in 86. Anybody else was... 90, Mabel was in 90. Abru, were you? No, 94, and then there was another one, 97. And Abru was involved in the, the thing in Vienna, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but here, you know, here are the artists. They were the skier, which is, I think, Penny Palmer. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Al Medioli, this is uh, Mark. Mark, uh, Mark, um, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> it's coming, it's all coming back to me, but it just takes a little time. <laughs> uh, and here we are. We, we documented a, a beautiful place on the, the end of the peninsula, Bodrum Peninsula, which was without uh, electric, with, I mean, it was untouched in 74, but about to explode. So it was a place of maybe eight or 900 
residents and grew by the time we finished mapping in 97 to about 150,000. I think now it's up to 300. I, I don't know, you would know probably. Yeah. Uh, tourist, I mean, it's a condominium, whatever, waterfront thing. So all that material culture, you know, it's very interesting in anthropology. David knows that because we talked about that a little bit back whenever, 87. And um, uh, this was a study that I considered to be an anthropology of the built environment, um, which I thought was extremely overlooked. I mean, it was a famous department here. But they did pots and pans and you know that kind of stuff, and I was interested in buildings. Um, so I won't go into that in any detail, but we can always come back to any of this. Uh, here's the first meeting with Suha here, myself. Uh, here we are trying to get organized. Here's Ataturk on the wall. Uh, Penny and Miranda are here. Mark is here. Um, here's Suha. Here's some consultants from the town. And, and Michael Sorkin, who somehow just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so I, I thought I, I put this in because now Michael's stuff is in Avery, all his archive and stuff. He has six more feet of boxes than I do, uh, but I'm working on that. And, and, <laughs> and, and Alessandro, you know, and Ignacio back there, uh, and Ira, uh, they've helped me out because I'm using a little some space in their office and I've been going through literally thousands of slides. Um, anyway, that's here. This is just one little vignette. This is 1974, Ali and Nassibi Yavuz. They had a beautiful house. And here they are in the last year we were actually there for field work with uh, Kathy Way, who was a GSAP student. Um, Ali had passed away, but uh, Nassibi was still still functioning in that beautiful house, surrounded now by condominiums and whatever you can imagine. Uh, here, another family, a fantastic house. This has all disappeared. Um, but I do want to say one thing, and then we'll come back to it, about cognition and representation and language. This drawing, this technique took a year to develop here. With a, with a group. Is Al Medioli here by any chance? Al's not here. Yeah. Um, well, he was very important in this. And we had to develop the technique of how to show a tree, how to show rocks, how to show dry laid you know, stone and this and that. And we developed a whole lexicon. And then the drawings were made by literally patching together um, you know, the, the patterns, sort of like my my sweater, but I'm coming back to this later in case. <laughs> uh, and then we move from Bodrum to Vienna. I just mentioned this because it's interesting. Um, and we worked, and Abra was part of that team. Um, we worked uh, in the Architecture Centrum on this project, working with the Turkish community in Vienna and the Turkish community in Vienna did not have an easy life, let's put it that way. So we had a very interesting uh, moment of putting together their stories uh, and making uh, the exhibit, which you see here. I think Abram's here, right? Where? Oh, here, yeah. Then Abram goes on to study urban planning here, PhD, whatever. You know, and uh, <laughs> whatever. And then uh, the other long, these are all like real studios. These are long-term studios. And we go to um, the Adirondacks. That was eight or 10 years, probably realistically 10 years. I was studying in, in this village. Um, this was a place where the New York intellectual community was in the summer. People like Henry James, Felix Adler, um, it was a very interesting urban intellectual outpost in, um, in this wilderness, especially in the 19th century. 
So we, we were very involved with this place, and I won't go into detail on that, but again, this was done with communities, a local um, um, uh, museum. Uh, there, there were always clients, and there was a huge need here. I mean, nobody was paying attention to this place. Um, uh, Davidson did give us money from Kaplan, so there, there was some support, but you know, there were, it, 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 they were really needy, let's put it that way. So it was perfect. Um, that's in Frank Owen's studio. He's a good painter from New York that had a studio up there. So this is all about advocacy. This is another quote from the book, and I'll show a few more um, slides about advocacy and the positive side of working in places with some negative problems. <laughs> Uh, when we were students, the Team, team Ten Primer came out in 1965, and uh, this was our Bible. Forget about Le Corbusier, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> Team Ten was it, <laughs> and, uh, and I especially liked this picture. This is a cafe, I believe, in Dubrovnik, and I said, wow, if urban studies can be, you know, like this, I want in on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, this is too good to be true. <laughs> you sit around and drink and talk about stuff. So, so, I got, so then I, when I went through all these slides, I found what I call table shots. I mean, so these are you guys sitting around a table talking about somebody's horrendous problem, uh, but with some libation of some sort. So, you know, so here we are in Sarajevo. We worked, of course, in Mostar. Um, I don't know if anybody here was in... Oh yeah, you were my, you were everywhere in these things. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so here's the GSAP crowd. This is Inyaki who contributed, you know, we jointly wrote something about Mexico City. He's here, this is Maria Paula Campagno. Um, so th these are the kind of places that we were, and we did a number of studies which Andres mentioned uh, we did this new urbanism series. Um, this was against the new urbanism thing that was going on out in California or wherever they were. Uh, and so we have, of course, Naples, Caracas, Mostar, Prague, Caracas, Lardarello, Baltimore, Gowanus. Then Princeton Architectural Press got sick of publishing these things, so we just went on Lulu after that or <laughs> did whatever we could. <laughs> Uh, here we are in Mostar. This was the front line. We were there right as the shooting had stopped, most of it, um, but tremendous destruction. And it gets to the question of urban, ur, 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 urbanicide, um, which of course remains a huge question today, even more so, as we all know. I'm just looking at the newspaper. But that was the front line. This was the famous bridge, which of course they destroyed. Uh, so this is 68. Actually, my first trip to Europe, um, uh, among other places, I went to Bosnia and Mostar. It was a beautiful place. I mean, here the cities were burning, you know, it was Newark, Detroit, whatever. Uh, and we go, I go to to Mostar, and there's Muslims, Christians, everybody's living together, they're living well, Every, the food was good, the wine was even better, you know, the whole thing was good, uh, which we see here, I, took, I found this slide, and then in 1998, don't forget. Uh, so that was a very important experience. They've since reconstructed the bridge, but it looks sort of like this, but it's new. Um, here we are in Caracas. Now we get to Alessandro and Ignacio, and who else was in Caracas? I, oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> you actually did two studios there. <laughs> who else? I don't know. Uh, well, we did two studios there. The first one was a, high, a highway was gonna cut through uh, a, a big piece of informal so-called fabric, and then this was the famous mudslide, which he, enormous destruction. Um, 
and we were asked to come there. I think originally Shabbos thought it was a great idea, and then he got a little bit crazy and thought the Americans were going to take over his government because there was a ship out, out in the water and stuff like that. So uh, we did the studios, but uh, of course, as is the case in our line of work, you know, politics changed things. Um, but anyway, that was Caracas. Then we have Belgrade. Uh, Belgrade was very interesting. They were still uh, very unhappy with the NATO bombing. Uh, this is, of course, the, the um, military uh, headquarters for, for Serbia. Um, and here we are. This is the Columbia folks outside. We always worked with students also from the, from the, the places where we were, we were working. Um, Actually, this, this is now the building. I don't know if you saw in the Times two days ago. I mean, this is what Jared Kushner is now after. <laughs> he wants to put a luxury hotel in there. Uh, and, and Trump has been after that for 20 years. Now, Trump, Trump's probably having money problems <laughs> as, <laughs> as we speak. But anyway, this is, uh, uh, this, this, they got their eye on this site. <laughs> uh, and this is what, 2002, so 20 years later, we're, uh, it's still there. Um, here we are in Kharkiv, uh, which is a, an amazing town, two million people. Uh, this is where Sputnik was, was developed. This had a huge technical capacity, 50 universities, and now, of course, in deep, deep trouble. Uh, but we were studying what could be a post-Soviet uh, further post-Soviet development in the town. This is the great uh, Derzprom building, which God knows what it looks like now, but a tremendous constructivist uh, development. Um, here we are finally in Kumasi in, in Ghana. Uh, ah, okay, so wait a minute. Now we're getting into Sagi. Where is, where is this? Where are we? This is Sagi and... Who else is here? Oh, you're, yeah, right, you're there. Who else? Austin, you weren't in this, right? Which one? Oh, you were in Harkov. Oh, all right, huh. Well, you know, it gets a little mixed up, because I, <laughs> uh, uh, and we did, in the Urban Design Lab, then we did a hospital design for them uh, with some doctors, which is very interesting. I, I won't show any of this stuff. This is Victor Body Lawson, I think. That's Victor, right? Um, who taught in the UD program here for a number of years. Well, this is Victor, at least, here. Uh, he, Victor graduated in 84. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you graduated in 79, right? <laughs> And Rick, 76, was it? <laughs> yeah. So we got a good spread here. And, you know, and you're, you're, uh, Carol's, Carol was extremely helpful as a student. I'll never forget that. Because there was, you know, there was a kind of a little bit of tempest here. We were still kind of crawling out of the the situation, say, the 68 and all of that. Um, and, and now she's been very active with the alumni, I think. Um, Rick's, Rick's uh, work with Baruch Houses is in the, in the book, you know, uh, one of the first, that was one of the first studios. We actually tried to add housing to, um, you know, to NYCHA, I mean, the same, it's the same discussion now, 60 years later, actually. <laughs> Nobody figured this out. Um, jo oh, Justin, which studio were you? I forgot. You were in the studio, too, right? A part teaching. Huh? Ah, right, yeah. yeah. But Justin taught. You're still teaching, right? Here? Yeah, All right. Um, the Bronx, the Mott Haven studio, that was, um, 
also very intense. We worked with a community organization up there. Uh, the community was not quite as in, in bad shape as in, in Mantua, but almost. Uh, but we started experimenting with media and cognition. We're using Xerox machines. We're using the first computer studio at Columbia, which was 1989. Anybody in that studio? Carla was in it. Carla here? Rusty? No. Um, and uh, communication is very important. I mean, if we couldn't do the publication, we got the exhibit out in, in the discussion. So that's at storefront, and here it is downstairs in Avery. Um, and uh, let's see, and the same we did, we did the several studios in Brussels, very interesting ones. Um, this was an exhibit there. We pasted the map of Brussels on the floor and polyurethaned over it. As far as I know, that is still there. <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, Detroit. We did the Detroit studio. Uh, here was a storefront exhibit on Detroit. Uh, this is when, after they changed the facade. Uh, and, then, and then there was a whole series of pop-ups in Detroit itself. Um, Okay. Oh, oh, this one I put in, yeah, because the public space aspect of these studios was very important, especially for the exhibits. Here's one in Salzburg on uh, the Summer Academy in which we pasted. We had a thing about pasting you know, photocopies up. It was like, <laughs> and here we pasted it on the bridge, which was a very, they wanted to destroy the bridge, which nobody wanted. And so we pasted the exhibit there and had a very enthusiastic uh, pasting um, uh, committee. This happens to be uh, Hubert's father, Hubert Klopner. Anybody remember Hubert? Who's now at the ATI, I think. <laughs> he came and helped us. Uh, then there's, of course, the Urban Design Lab, which starts in 20, 2005. And that sort of solved my dream of having an integration with science, with hard science and soft science, basically. And it was very interesting, although they weren't always very nice to us, but you know, uh, we, uh, we did what we wanted to. Um, and this was, this were early projects and how, you can't, sorry, you can't read this, but how they integrated with different disciplines within the Earth Institute, because the Earth Institute now is in the climate school and there's a whole different thing going on. Uh, and this was one of the first publications around climate, which we did with Mary Paula Suto, who's here. And I would have to say, without Maria Paula, there would not have been an urban design lab. <laughs> so uh, she had her, her uh, she was into the whole thing. <laughs> um, and here are some of the reports from the Urban Design Lab. We, we did a lot of work with Dominican Republic, which is still ongoing through Columbia World Projects. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, here Puerto Plata in Dominican Republic, here Haiti. I don't know, is Richard here, Gonzalez, no? Uh, well, he was very involved. He taught some in GSAP, but also was doing a lot of work in the Urban Design Lab uh, at that time. Uh, and then we did a lot of water, what you could call water urbanism studies, and most of these have to do with the Hudson River, Upper Delaware. Um, this one was in Seoul. Um, I think these are still on a website. I guess it's still active, I don't know. Um, and let's see, history. Uh, history is a complicated question. Um, but I always had, uh, I had trouble reading Tafuri, but I always thought he had some interesting ideas that you could use, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, he's saying, uh, anyway, this is my, uh, my take on Tafuri. But anyway, we started doing the um, 
at that point, I know it was earlier, but we started to do the urban design seminar, and one of the things I insisted on doing was taking a piece of urban fabric, analyzing it, understanding the history, but with the intention of then understanding how that understanding could be used as a tool toward a new intervention. So many of you were victims of this process. <laughs> uh, I always wondered why you, you allowed yourselves to just do black and white. <laughs> uh, but it's, they seemed to do it. And, um, and I, I insisted. Because I thought for the purpose of this study, color was noise. I didn't want noise. I wanted, I wanted just the, the pattern. And, uh, and my, my, my sweater testifies to the importance of this strategy. <laughs> and, and my good friend, Daria Dorosh, who, who's taught at FIT for, I think, as many years as I've been here, maybe, and is, is a great artist, she has contributed a sweater using uh, fabric swatches from, <laughs> from, from, I don't know how many, 20 years of doing fabrics and typologies. Um, Okay, we're getting close. Ah, here's one of those reviews. Um, here is what? Here's Varin, who taught in the program. Varin is, is, Varin is over here. Uh, EJ, who was always very good about coming and sitting through very long uh, meetings. Uh, here, this is Vanessa, this is Richard Gonzalez, I think. Uh, and of course, they put these these very large drawings on the walls, which I insisted on. Um, I think, I'm not sure that would work anymore. Maybe it could get students to do that. You have to tell me, somebody, if there are any students, present students, let me know what you think. But anyway, uh, Praditi was fantastic. She put together two large volumes of all these studies for the last 10 years. Um, and. Uh, really deserves a lot of credit for that. She was also very important in the final stages of getting uh, material into the Avery archive. Uh, so is Chris or Terry here? The, the, I mean, they were great at slowly absorbing all my stuff, which you can see is rather uh, momentous. Or OK, New York City. Uh, this was the first study which led to the second study, which led to the, the book of 1990 and then 19, 2016, I think, was the last edition. Uh, there was always a lot, in the beginning, a lot of interest in Europe in this work, more than here, I would say. Um, so the French published, uh, Mardegas published this one in, when was it, 83 or 4 or something like that. Um, uh, Manuel de Sola Morales, he tried to get it in Spanish, but it didn't work. It did get published in Japanese, which was weird, but you know, uh, whatever. Let's see. And this study was important following up on, on the studio of, of uh, 76. In the precursor to the Urban Design Lab, I started this thing called Urban Design Research Group. And we had a contract with NYCHA to figure out how to reconfigure uh, public space, especially around safety issues, uh, public safety. And uh, that followed up on a project here by Oscar Newman, Defensible Space, which was in GSAP, by the way, in the early 70s, I guess. I forget when that book was published. You know, it's a well-known book. I mean, it's still useful to read it. Um, so I put this in just as a question of continuity. And then finally, I think we will go to language. Uh, and I, uh, well, I went to a technical school. I knew computers were going to be important. I didn't know what they were, actually. But I knew there's something about this that was going to mean something someday. And I knew the value of digitizing which of course what we do with computers. Uh, so I started looking, this is 67 already. I started looking at, um, this was a road study in Bucks County 
um, a, a locational study for the road, and we started to correlate all these factors, uh, digitizing um, a dialectic system, positives and negatives, and then overlaying them by hand and figuring out what the, then the, the, the path of least resistance would be, right? That's basically what it is. Okay, so uh, I, I throw that in because this was uh, in my, actually my master's dissertation, which was completely crazy. I mean, more crazy than, than Daria's, uh, you know, sweater. <laughs> was, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, but was all about this, this beginning of the cyber age, right? The new information. Um, and I read it now, and I, I did read it, and I thought, wow, how did I ever think of such crazy stuff? But anyway, this was Mantua. And Mantua, we, we digitized a huge number of social and physical environmental factors, modeled them into what you could call, what we would call today like in the Data Science Institute here, a agent-based model. That is, something happens and the other thing shifts and then something happens there and it shifts around in order to make decisions. And our, our, our problem was how to um, uh, decide where the new infill housing would be when this is kind of the final map. Um, and here we are. Again, I won't go through this, but it was complicated. But then finally, when we get to 91 here, um, we have the first um, computer studio. And there was a bunch of silicon graphics machines, which probably nobody knows what they are now. But they, that was the pioneering stuff. And, and this guy, Christos Tuntas in Eden Muir, taught this course. Uh, and it was, it was miserable to do this um, because you had to plot each point by hand. But that's what we were doing in 67 anyway, so why not? Somebody else should suffer uh, in the same way. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, yeah, this was, uh, I, I won't go into these, but this was modeling of, dynamic modeling of Mott Haven for basically physical, social issues. This is Carla's. This is Min Sook, who's a, a, a great architect in Seoul, by the way, a graduate of school. Um, Ian Gonzalo Vera did a very interesting study of, of fires. Uh, of course, the place was, was on fire, basically. Um, and from there, we then, in the, the Urban Design Lab, and then with the Data Science Institute, uh, move into um, social media, especially Twitter. Uh, and this was revolutionary, of course. With Twitter, you could see in real time how space was being occupied. Uh, and then you could attach sentiment to the tweets. Um, it's all pioneering stuff, but I'm sure DARPA and the Defense Department is much more advanced than anybody else at this point. Um, but these were Data Science Institute days when, when you you know, you put up your poster. And this was my um, experience with uh, science, uh, peer-reviewed stuff, uh, which I hated. But I understand it's important. I mean, in science is so different. I mean, you do something, and then there's a record. And, and the record is there, right? And you build on the record, you build on a record, you build on a record. The problem with architecture is, you know, I don't want to say too much here, but you know, I mean, no architect really wants to go back and see how their building works. <laughs> Just we know. So, all right. So anyway, that's that. And then we have other studies. This is Twitter distribution in New York, which of course concentrated where the population density is highest. This is an interesting study of um, uh, Twitter hotspots in, in the subway stations. Of course, people get out of the subway and they immediately uh, send a message because it doesn't work inside. But that's because they're changing now. Now it's, you can put it anywhere. This is an interesting one um, just being published now about uh, how the uh, COVID changed the Twitter dynamics in New York City um, with uh, Carmelo 
in Yakolo, who was, uh, he's now at MIT, just got his PhD, who's uh, uh, worked with us, uh, who was in the urban design program s several years ago. So that's it. I'm not even gonna read this. This is all in the book. You should have memorized these things by now. <laughs> Uh, but I, I saw, you know, I really want to see what other people think of this thing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to collegial discussion. We are all friends, right? <laughs> and uh, as we'll keep going. Uh, Mary, Mary, uh, she's of the faculty. You are, you've been here longest now. Yeah. So you, well, you, you're going to say something, right? And, uh, I don't know. Taylor, Taylor's here. Now I see people. I'm, it's coming back. Taylor worked with the uh, alternative suburbia thing, which I didn't show. But I, again, it was a Penn State study that then became very important in the studio we did in Genoa. And he did a beautiful housing scheme with that. Every, you know, okay. I, this is now all these faces, but we. You want this? Yeah, yes. Forward. Forward. Okay. And do we have to hold it or whatever? Um, I'm going to, I actually wrote something out. I was the opposite of Richard. He thought it was going to be a small gathering. I thought it was in Wood Auditorium and going to be super formal. So um, I'll try to improvise a little bit and not talk too long because that was such a great presentation. Um, and more specifically, before we turn to Richard's remarkable book, um, I want to pay tribute to him for all he's brought to the school. This is our one chance to really say thank you to him and to express my own immense personal gratitude. He was there when I began. He's the person who actually interviewed me when I got hired, and we, we taught together. <laughs> I think Ken gave him a nudge about hiring me, but he put up with it. Okay. Um, what... Fine, what might not fully come across in the book, um, despite its close connection to his teaching at Columbia, is this immense contribution that he gave to the school. I think you got a sense of it from these amazing images. But I'm going to go back to 78. He was the chair of architecture then. We had a kind of chair and had already, with the support of the close colleagues, Kenneth Frampton and Dean Jim Polchak, who was the dean at the time, done much to transform the school, which, as you all know, had really gone through a lot in 68. I arrived the first year, this is fall 78, of the implementation of the third semester housing studio in which Richard played a fundamental role, both implementing and directing with it. And as you know, remains, even if it's transformed over the years, uh, something he commented on, um, such a fundamental part of the MR curriculum. To give, I didn't do the slides. I'm forgetting it. That was supposed to show his 50 years, not just at Columbia, but globally, where he's had an impact, which we saw. <laughs> what? <laughs> this? It's hardly can see it in the light, because they were very fine. Everybody used 3-0 pens in those days. Um, anyway, I arrived to the first year of the housing studio. And just to give you a little background of how things change, it was then organized by typology. Uh, it was mu or row housing, perimeter block, that was Ken Frampton's favorite. Um, Redon, which was, I taught one year, I think Eden Murr was in that studio, in fact. Um, 
and uh, sometimes experiments in mixed typology, such as high-rise, low-rise configurations. At that time, we very much envisioned housing as social or public housing and saw it as, we tried actually to be quite pragmatic. Uh, I think this got challenged uh, later on. Um, came up with fairly realistic, or we could say semi-realistic solutions following more or less city codes. But of course, students rebelled and that was fine. Um, then as now, uh, students worked in teams. But what you might not know is the faculty worked in teams as well. Uh, there were a lot of really strong debates, sometimes passionate, and in the case of students, divorces. Uh, but I don't think any of us uh, actually split ways. And I taught with Richard one year when Loretta Vincerelli used to normally teach what we called carpet or patio housing. Uh, she knew well the Inacasa, the Libra projects from Rome, but she was, I don't know where, maybe in Marfa, Texas then, and Richard and I took it up. It led to fairly rigid schemes, as you can look. It was a challenge uh, to make it work. Besides Richard, among those teaching housing in those years were Kenneth Frampton, I mentioned, Max Bond, Michael Mosteller, who I think was a former colleague of Richard's for Rensselaer. Uh, okay, uh, really a great housing teacher. Loretta, I mentioned, Roy Strickland, whom I also co-taught with once and myself. Um, now, one of the wonderful things about teaching the housing studio, uh, okay, is that the right slide? Um, was that New York City was our laboratory. And Richard, he showed those amazing images all over the world, but what I really experienced working with him in those years was just learning about New York. I discovered neighborhoods in Queens I'd never seen or heard of, um, but also learned so much about the remarkable housing stock in New York. Um, there are the books you've already seen. He skipped his first edition. Um, and this was some of the amazing projects we looked at. Um, they were Sunnyside Gardens, Forest. Why is this? Oops. There you can see it uh, with its landscape uh, built, Forest Hills, Jackson Heights, which was a special favorite of Richard's. And if you, that's an old photo. I don't think they're awnings anymore. Um, but uh, I'm sure they're not. I was just there. Great food, by the way. Um, but uh, Richard mentions Jackson Heights several times in the book. Uh, it was, it's an amazing community uh, in terms of housing options. Um, or even the grand concourse for elevator buildings. Um, well, we explored a variety of scales in housing. It was clear that Richard, like many others uh, in the faculty, had this commitment to low-rise, high-density housing as an alternative, this is the early 80s, to both the Towers in the Park public housing of the Moses era and the low-density Nimaya projects that were being built then in the destroyed or devastated areas of the Bronx. Why is this so stubborn? Um, and some of the studio projects actually addressed which um, this sort of alternative uh, to um, densities that I just mentioned. Uh, two other uh, very related concerns to this that Richard would continue to pursue in his other housing, other studios, not just housing, urban design, um, were first the repair or renovation of existing high-rise public housing projects of the 50s and 60s. And this included adding low-rise housing and commercial structures along the street front and rethinking, this was critical to him, the ground plane as not exclusively open public space. And the second was what he called the urbanization of suburbia, again, working for this intermediate density. 
Both of these efforts are again discussed in trenchant essays. It's a word Marta Gutman used to describe the book, and I think it's really pointed, um, especially, for instance, in the essay Towers in the Park, explaining the work of a 1976 studio. For me, there's almost always a pragmatic activist dimension to Richard's studio teaching. Um, and you might note the phrase in this quote, enlightened and pragmatic approach. Um, there was always this real dimension. I think he got frustrated with someone like me who got a little too in the theory world at times, even though he did read Tafori. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the goal was really to address the extensive urban blight uh, brought on, and this was so visible in the late 70s and 80s still, in part by urban renewal and suburban flight. Another aspect which he didn't talk about was Richard's leadership. Low key, full of ironic, self-effacing humor, you got a dose of it today, but also, which you might not have noticed, very strong-willed. Um, he had a great commitment to diversity, something he shared with Jim Polshek in those early years, despite their sometimes heated differences. And it would not be until many years later that we had as many black and women faculty, not to mention minority students, as we had during Richards and Max Bond, who followed him to chairmanship. Among the women, some full-time, some adjunct, who were on the architecture faculty, and there were others in planning, uh, were Ada Carmi, Susanna Torrey, Amy Anderson, Barbara Litzenberg, Gwendolyn Wright, and I think only Berkeley could talk about as many. When I went to Harvard one year in the 80s, there was only one other woman faculty member. Columbia was really exceptional at that point. I, I think it already came through as something I just want to emphasize was a strong commitment to social justice and social equality. It's not an accident. Um, and Andres already pointed to this, uh, <coughs> that he wrote with Marta Gutman on the events of 68. And one of the essays in the book is actually revisiting his thoughts about that a conference organized by Joan Ackman at the Buell Center in 1998, where it's a really good essay, too, reflecting on what changed, what didn't work, et cetera. Um, but it was despite, um, you'll find some sort of semi-snide remarks about theory at times in the book. Um, but Richard was immersed in it. He may not want to admit to it, but we had this magazine called Pracy, but she had a very large role in getting to happen. And I don't know if you can see it, because it's not the sharpest of slides. That's standing on my part. Um, but he has an essay there on style that he wrote with a guy, Ken Kaplan, <coughs> and a kind of a clue to the kind of real intense debate that was going on. So I would see this period as strangely socially committed, but also very much involved with architecture, which might be the big shift uh, with 68. This extended, of course, to the global scene. You don't need me to repeat what he did so well. Um, so I will ignore Turkey for the moment. I, I might mention there he is at Cuba um, with a historic preservation studio. Um, and I think he got Bob Stern upset from what he told me, because Bob Stern, I think, was the director of preservation uh, in organizing this trip uh, to Cuba. <coughs> what? So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I haven't been. I haven't been using my mic. Can you hear me when I? Okay. Hello. Works. So there's this this Cuban student in, in preservation, uh, and uh, he was very keen. You know, well, actually, Havana has the largest intact Baroque uh, quarter in the world. Uh, it's, it was very beautiful. So uh, so he he wanted us to go to uh, Cuba, and everybody thought. Well, Bob should like this because, you know, 
he was kind of into Baroque himself. I mean, he was <laughs> postmodern, whatever. So, so uh, Bob was totally against it. And he said, you're all going to be communist dupes, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And then he told them, and, and they insisted, of course. Then he told them, I mean, this Cuban guy was tough. So then they he told them, well, if you're going to go to Cuba, I'm not allowing any preservation faculty to go with you. So you're going to have to find, and you're going to have to go with a faculty member. So, so of course, they came to me. <laughs> and I said, wow, Cuba. <laughs> so that's my Bob Stern story. <laughs> But I think Bob would have liked that he's standing in front of this college. <laughs> but this is actually the university. So where, this is Havana. very much low library in, yeah, in Havana. About, yeah. But I asked my students at what orders low library had, and only one person could tell me. So well, I think, I think it's, this, an, this it's a was, different era. <laughs> this was designed by uh, Stanford White, I believe, the campus. I, I, I'm not, I, I trust can't. you. I don't know. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I could g talk about other things that he didn't mention. There was a very strong, long link to Leuven, Catholic University. And one of the essays that really struck me because of my own fascination with Algeria is they did a project together um, redoing a kind of housing, uh, rather desolate part of eastern Algiers. Um, trying to knit the fabric together. And that's just one of Richard's sort of repeated, even as it changes, obsessions. How do we repair, rethink our mistakes, the afterlife of buildings? Um, in New York Global, um, the, this political uh, commitment to architecture, and I have to admit, sometimes I can't quite put my fingers on his politics, but we can talk about that. Um, it comes uh -oh. for me best through in the book um, with the quotations. And I only list a few of the names. There were so many more. Lots of economists I'd never heard of and some ecology people in the introduction that I also had never heard of. But uh, you get an idea of the amazing range, a kind of erudition that he wears so lightly and so unpretentiously uh, but it's really there uh, in the book. And I um, want to end with two quotes I chose that I thought summarized it, and he already gave us one of them, although I added the, an extra sentence to it um, from Giancarlo De Carlo. Um, sometimes translated participation, I think another time legitimizing architecture. And the other quote is by the amazing French ancient historian, um, Paul Vena, which I think is so appropriate for this moment. Um, every patchwork culture, with its diversity, opens the way to inventiveness. Without a doubt, knowing, wanting to know only one culture, one's own, is to be condemned to a life of suffocating sameness. sameness. And for me, this just has such resonance exactly right now. Thank you, Richard. Now what? <laughs> Wait. Yeah. No, that was there. Yeah. I'll have to go back and look at that problem. <laughs> but uh, there was that that was pieced together from notes. Okay. 
handwritten notes, and um, that yes, was highly it, influenced it, by we Lefebvre. Tell the audience, what we're talking oh. about. Um, <laughs> the, the first essay, the one that Richard referred to, called Vietnam, and I have to admit, I lived through this. He was a little older than me, but. Um, you know, it was my first exposure to the computer, um, put punching in draft resistance cards. Uh, but anyway, he uses the word in the essay that puzzled me, post-Marxist and neoliberal. And I don't think I heard those terms. Post-Marxist, no, certainly was... not before about 89. No, no, and no, that's from Lefebvre. Neoliberal. No, I here it is. We are, we are, this is yeah, I did it too. We are in a neoliberal no post marxian moment. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a feeling your notes got edited. <laughs> so, uh, maybe we can. I mean, there's. All there's, right, me a call. Enough yeah. on this in talk. This is the kind of thing the faculty used to get I mean, stuck I, on. We propose now. I mean, there's amazing colleagues here that have been reading the book, and it's also a moment to, to reflect on the book, and of course, Richard's legacy both in the school and, and beyond and and also open it to the to the audience at one point. So I would propose that Michael you start and then we follow. And Richard of course when you want to, to respond or clarify yes. 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 I'm still worried about the neoliberals. <laughs> That's post Marxist is definitely in Lefebvre. Neoliberal, I don't know if that was We all stopped with that because it's in an essay dated nineteen seventy. And and the the, first one, yes, and three of us, three of us clearly stuff. So if you, as you read the book, as you read the book, you'll see it. Uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, listen, uh, this is, you have so many uh, former faculty members and students and people that have been an important part of the urban design program and the school here. So it, it, it's wonderful to take a moment here to speak, but of course, uh, it, it feels pretentious to try to replace all of the voices that were with you while you did this. I, I, I read the book and wrote notes about trying to respond to the book, but after we're, and I've known Richard for 26 years at least, personally as a friend, but um, I also thought afterwards that, wait a minute, it's uh, we should look forward, and the book is organized in a very careful way, precisely as you mentioned, to, to try to make sense of things that were real-time, contemporaneous, shared among colleagues, people, students, uh, and that were live. And part of the reason I think, obviously, that you put this together was to try to not lose studios and all this work. You know, you were a bit vulgar about it to the trash can, but clearly it's not in the trash can, none of it anyway. But um, so then I thought, okay, a little bit personal. I did not intend to end up at Columbia myself. It, it turned out I was close with people here and it made sense. And I did a book called Slow Space that in, in 1998 that involved a huge amount of the faculty. So something very organic happened and I landed at Columbia, which has been wonderful, but I also got very involved with housing in Houston, Texas, teaching at Rice University, and I backed myself into reading housing law very carefully, carefully Clinton era housing law, 1996, uh, Hope 6, 1998, Quality Housing Work Responsibility Act, but these were you know, arcane laws that nonetheless had very real effects. So that led to you know, becoming known about housing and staying with it, it led to ultimately being offered to lead the housing studio at GSAP, come from Texas to New York, and not having read your book until I got here, um, and not being super acclimated to the New York City system, even though of form, even though of course I knew it, I'd been here many times. But I tell the personal side because when I came here, I very quickly dug in and thought, you know, I need to talk to people who know this better than I do. I mean, I had, I had, a, I had a direction. But I, you know, so I talked to Kenneth and I talked to Richard. I said, well, how did you found the housing studio? Why did it happen? And I said, you know, Bella Abzug, housing is a right. Were you guys overtly political? And you said to me, no, 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 we were not overtly political. Housing itself was political. And then you made a, a comment. Stephen Hall made it political when he made it about artists and painters. Uh, Gwanis Kwanikanao, in other words, Stephen made it more poetic when he took over the housing studio. So I say all that because the more I got to know Richard, and I see it reading the book carefully, is this is the simple point I would make because we all have to talk here. Is the throughout the book you and you said it here today, you're alluding to migrating into urbanism and the hard science, and then the messy problems. I thought horse riddle, wicked problems when I read that, 
but the, the problem is that don't have a profession to solve them. And, uh, and the, soft, the soft sciences, and very early in the book is a quote from Kurt Vonnegut. And you know, the part for me about, yeah, I read. It was on the list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw it. So the, the Vonnegut part, you know, as much as many people know Vonnegut well, you know, I read it in, in college or high school very carefully and was obsessed with it. But there was always looking at the, word, the world through a kind of absurdist lens. Vonnegut, the character, sees a Hertz truck drive by, and he thinks the truck hurts. It's in pain. But so it's a person who's like linguistically estranged from this is Kilgore Trout. So this side of you is the more I read the book, uh, the more I thought it's so important that you did the book and that we have it now and all the people that have been part of this because there's this constant attempt to mix hard science, soft science, and soft science is culture, art, policy, law, I think, and, the, and perhaps the Fori. And then there's this other thing closer to real history that you're trying to do, but the hard science, and, and in, it's, it's all, I think, in search of an apparatus that allows us to work on something that requires a different sort of profession. I always thought you kind of graduated out of housing and invented urban design so that you could do that. Um, so I, I could go on, but that is the part I would come back around to, is that as much as it's a history of things that you encountered and did, there's a locomotion to the way you organized it that absolutely is saying, we need to keep trying to invent this other profession or whatever it's called. And the last several years ago, you muttered something <laughs> with your typical, as Mary said, quietness but seriousness. That you weren't quite. Forgive me if I'm quoting you out of school, but I'm going to do it. Uh, you weren't quite sure we were still in architecture school. We were doing something equally important, but more spread out. And I'll leave it at that. But I really think that what you are. This book is so valuable because you're trying to describe this kind of character, which was you that is trying to map out a way to address all of this. And you're not willing to do it through traditional practice, nor, as you say explicitly in the book, you weren't too interested in being part of the, the then new avant-garde. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. There's much more, but th it's a pleasure to read this book, I must say. It's really remarkable. And for those of us that teach and invest a lot in teaching, it's an incredible template for how to record and keep what happens with all the people. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I picking the essays, I was helped a lot by Audrey. Is she here, Dandenal? Who was uh, then a student. And, um, and it was very interesting to me, because there was a lot of stuff, right? Um, it was very interesting to me to uh, try to, to have a perspective of an of a current student looking at this stuff. And uh, she gave some very good advice. And it was a question whether to keep Vietnam in there or not and things like that. Um, so, but my, my, I think there's also the question of continuity and um, my thought was everybody should make the same book. I mean, you know, it's important. I mean, scientists do it. I mean, they publish these arcane articles and, you know, they just keep reading them and it's like, you know, whatever. And uh, and and it's, uh, it's very interesting to see the people here because most of you were part of this continuity somehow. Um, you know, even faculty. Ira's back there. I mean, Ira, <laughs> Ira was in Mostar as a, a student at Temple, right? Yeah. It, and then came, then she went to Harvard, but then she taught here in Ecuador in urban design. Um, I'm just thinking, oh, I mean, there are all these connections to be made, and they're very positive, but they should be maintained. I mean, the problem is, lo I think loss of information is a problem in our discipline, you know, that we, um, but anyway. No, but I, no, you guys should say whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. well, <laughs> what to say? Well, first of all, I, I, I want to join Mary and, and, and others in thanking Richard for, for so many things, you know, that, that go typically unnoticed and un, you know, recognized uh, amongst colleagues uh, over you know, many years uh, for myself as well. 
Um, I, there, I've been thinking, trying to think of, of a kind of vocabulary with which to summarize uh, this. And I, I don't really, I haven't, I, I wanted to say to thank you for the friction. There's a kind of, um, you know, directness. I think Mary did actually, you, you summarized it well. Uh, unvarnished, you know, kind of like um, hallway kind of conversation that that I sort of see leaking into what you were showing, and 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 I uh, have over the years very much appreciated uh, that that one can speak one's mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, yeah, and you know. Um, and because that is not always the case in, uh, in academia. The other thing I wanted to acknowledge, you know, and I think you, you kind of said this in different ways, but, but over these years, uh, you taught in the graduate school, first of all, what was it? The Graduate School of Architecture and Planning, right. the 1P, and then, you know, yeah, what we know. Yeah, the, the extra That the, was controversial. And yeah, yeah, I know. I remember that. <laughs> this is where I come in. It's somewhere in there. I, I do recall this conversation, sort of sadly. But, um, but you also have consistently and regularly taught in Columbia University. Uh, your participation, your, in your formal affiliation with the Earth Institute, your collaboration with colleagues like Trisha Culligan, for example, in, in CES, in the Global Science Institute, and so on. Uh, and, and I think that you, you know, it, it doesn't, you made this much more legible than, uh, than it might have been to us by showing us the teaching and then the records of the teaching in such a systematic way. And that, that I think it's kind of you know, almost paradoxical that out of the details of what, you know, is after all a kind of very specific teaching format, the studio, uh, and the studio, these kind of traveling studios and the research studios and so on, you demonstrated very concretely the necessity of, of connecting between what you were describing as the heart and soul sciences, things like this. So, so that is something that can't be done just anywhere. And, and, and I think in that regard, you, you've shown us something about what we can do. We don't necessarily always do. The other, the other thing at a more personal level that we share is this polytechnic um, situation. <laughs> Uh, oh, both, of, both of us know our way, he, you more than me personally, oh, uh, around Troy, New York, and some other environs around there. And, uh, and I think that, you know, I, there is something to that uh, as well. I've always at least felt that. Um, I, am, I consider myself a product of the Team 10 primer, uh, maybe even more so, Still, generation. Yeah. Well, yes, in a certain sense. I, I don't want to go into that. But, uh, but, but in a... In a um, you know, I, I this is I'm looking at Sandra because this is, there's a few people here who I know from that environment, and there were something like six copies of that book in the Rensselaer Library. Oh, it came uh, to us yeah, it was headquarters of this, and during the year for me that, that was during the postmodern years. So, so oh, we were right. yeah separated by some decades, but um, nonetheless, the, so all of this, you know, in a sense, is what I read and see between the lines of, of the text. And, and your wonderful presentation, which I think, it, you know, is in fact, it supplements the text. It's, it's almost like another book that you just presented yeah. to us yeah. on the screen. So, of that. you did, yeah, you should. Because <laughs> this is a boring view. Well, that's not boring, I mean, this is, it's, it's a book. But okay, just one, one thing, because I, I am, I, I'm curious. I really am, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, we're circling around this Vietnam question. And apparently it was an editorial decision to include the essay to me. Okay, look, there are different ways to read a book. Uh, one, one of the many ways that we all know is, is through the table of contents. This table of contents uh, is very carefully organized, um, and it, it, there are dates, and, and one can read you know, one's way through the chronology of the teaching as well as the kind of thematics, uh, again, that, that showed up in, in the research that you explained. But, but on page 21, even in the table of contents, the, this title, Vietnam, stands out. Uh, and it, it doesn't, you know, you didn't do a studio in Vietnam. Uh, and, and yet, it, it seems structural to, to the rest of the project. And, and I, I just want to ask, and, and just to, to give the audience some sense of what I'm at least trying to get at, is after the now controversial neoliberal quote, 
um, which has to be a, a, some mis, you know, kind of a, a projection onto your handwriting or something. I don't know however you transcribe this, but nonetheless, the concluding, it's yeah, it's worth checking. In any case, the concluding paragraph, I'll just read this, this paragraph if you don't mind. Um, I, I want to know the kind of trouble this got you into, first of all. Uh, what, uh, I, I, maybe our colleagues would like to know also, what informed the inclusion uh, ultimately of the essay you know, in a manner that provokes this kind of uh, discussion? Um, and, and what, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the discontinuities as much as the continuity space. So, so here it says, our society is ruled, and you gave us a little disclaimer, you know, this is like juvenilia. I wrote it a long time ago, I don't know, but, and yet it's here as the first essay. Our society is ruled as no other has been by the drive for production. Um, as production is powerfully oriented towards consumption, and as our consumption is limitless, so is production. To produce something means to destroy something else, whether Vietnam or increasingly our own cities. A dilemma for, of our production is that we must grow until there is nothing left to destroy. With quote unquote urban renewal, we posit change through destruction, right? So there's a kind of, I mean, today we might say a Marshall Berman kind of a theme. Uh, uh, yeah, of the, Marshall. You know, you know, Right, you know, here, but, but I don't, it doesn't seem to me just that. Um, our universities are further geared to this production and no amount of well-meaning special courses or days of concern, teach-ins and so on, I suppose also, um, will solve such problems required. So this is the militant claim, right? And, and I think what Mary was referring to is a kind of, I think correctly, a kind of reparative pragmatics. Yeah. That, that courses through the, the rest of the book and, and certainly through the presentation is a little bit at odds with this kind of militancy. Uh, required will be a withdrawal of resources from the lucrative production market to the job of making workable alternatives. Maybe it's the workable alternatives that we've been looking at. Uh, we must begin in the university. Uh, and so there's, you know, on the one hand, there's the, there's, there's the sense of of the sites of learning as, uh, as themselves, in a sense, the, the, the barricades, and, and literally and figuratively. And of course, you began with the first slide was Kent State. Um, but also, the university as, as an interface or a kind of locus within the world. Like, in other words, all, all this, the, the teaching, not as separate uh, and, and uh, as you know, something abstruse from or somehow. Uh, at, at some remove from the um, these 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 contradictions, uh, but none more, but but something that that belonged to them. So I'm I'm just honestly, it's just a kind of open question as to how now you read this, uh, how you know what fifty plus the years. Last, later. The last paragraph is a bit much. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But you know, this was, I mean, we I was already into Vietnam for 10 years. When they, the army came to my house, my parents' house, when I was still in high school, and, and tried to recruit me into ROTC. And they said, well, you know, it's a big world out there, and things are happening, and you'd probably be much better off, you know, uh, you know basically saving your ass. and." Um, and that would have been, uh, well, that was, yeah, to, when, uh, uh, at the, probably the last year of high school. Now, my mother, who wouldn't let us join the Boy Scouts because she said they were paramilitary, uh, <laughs> <laughs> slammed a door on that guy's ass. <laughs> but this was like, and, and whoever of my generation who went through this, they, they will, absolutely tell you i don't probably you had some of this right i mean this was horrible and and i think today you know so i and then i i didn't know whether to put that essay in or not but uh, it was a personal decision because i think people should understand where this started you know and why it's so weird richard um, can i add, add to so quickly because not, the essay is 1971 vietnam and my my older brother, the same thing happened 70, with them. Yeah. Seventy, it's Not after my, Kent State. Yeah, yeah. The, coming to recruit my older brother, I, I remember that same thing. But 
you talk about the great acceleration and do you note 1945 forward, but then you begin the book with 1970. And you, know, you quote Richard Nixon in here in destructive ways, but I was also, say, what's not quite mentioned directly is the end of the Bretton Woods treaties and you know, go, leaving the gold standard and the beginning of a different acceleration. So you know, that little 26 year window from the end of World War II to 1971, 71 forward is the neoliberal economy, thus it is weird to slightly see that mentioned as before. But along the line of, you get, what I kept thinking is you get up to 1987 in the United Nations, our common future document, and the beginnings of sustainability as a global problem. So the, this incredible, in a very short series of texts that are kind of extracted largely from syllabi, I think, you're, you're commenting. Well, yeah. The that, windows are. That kind of, dev the devastation, and I agree with Reinhardt very much, placing the site of education both on the ground in front of the real evidence, but continually pulling back out into policy. You're quoting various, the 1960, 1960 Housing Omnibus Act. So very specific about laws, very specific about economic moments, but then on the ground and I, too, was surprised, wondering about the degree to which it, the activism appears belligerent can, can or not. Can I say yeah. something? Let Richard wants yeah. to talk. But I left out a passage about he did have militant, a militant side in, that persisted at least through 86, and I would say even longer. Um, we, when I first came, there was a Brassini exhibition, and we were all furious that this is somebody celebrated in complexity and contradiction, a fascist architect. And we were all upset that his fascism wasn't acknowledged. So we all wrote, almost everybody on the faculty signed a letter to the New York Times. That's one example. That's one, in the archive. Yeah. OK, another one that he actually mentions in the book. And Richard was always a major voice in these things, but we all were pretty vocal. Was the demonstration we had, he calls it the end of an era, in 86 in front of the South African embassy, a consulate, excuse me. Everybody except one faculty member that was full time, I think, was there. Um, and we all got arrested, fortunately not put in prison, except Max Bond, who'd already been arrested twice and had to leave before they clamped the things on us. Um, and it really was a case of planners, architects, all acting together in collaboration and acting. I mean, that's what strike, struck me so much about Richard was there was this when I said pragmatic, it was not just designing realistically, but actually acting. Um, but I'm not sure there was that kind of activism very clearly after 86. Uh, it was the 80s, the well, Reagan Well, in era. Rome, the Iraq War, we, when we did the Lardarello studio, there was a big demonstration. That was good. We, we were all there, the, the Columbia so group he, we had. He kept thing. that militant streak. That was <laughs> yeah. the only point I really yeah. wanted to make. But let for me a while. say the production thing, that's Lefebvre. Yeah. yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. that was, the, uh, of course, it was a little incoherent. And, and it was this, this kind of you know, rally and all this stuff, and the kids were dead. And oh my God. So, but, but that was the idea that we, we had gone over the top with consumption. And it was being driven by this crazy production that had to, there was no end, right? There was, there was no way to stop it. And, and that's what that was about, which isn't very clear here, but I didn't change the, the text. And Lefebvre was a big influence right at that moment because his book Explosion came out just you know, a few months before and you know, everybody was reading Explosion and, and all that. So that, that, that explains that. Um, what happened was I, no, I don't, maybe this should be out. We talk about this in the street. But, but <laughs> the, what happened after that thing and all these guys in the suits with the cameras, um, didn't, uh, that didn't go down well with the university. Uh, and lo and behold, Jim Polshe came along at Columbia. <laughs> and I said, finally, and get back to New York because Penn State was way in the country. It was like, it takes six hour bus trip to get here. So, 
so that's how that that came about. Yeah. Plus, Kate? I had a very low lottery number. I think it was four, <laughs> <laughs> and that was extremely disturbing. <laughs> Anyway. Um, so I'm going to just jump in, just so we, um, uh, we don't, don't run out of time. Um, I have to admit that the reason that I don't have Richard's book on my lap is because I had it on an Amtrak train yesterday, and I found it absolutely gripping. And I dog-eared pages, and I underlined a lot of things, which I felt terrible about on the one hand, but I got so excited that I wanted to talk about all these things. And it's probably too late to talk about all those serious things that I wanted to talk about. And since we're on a sort of personal note, um, I, I just wanted to um, maybe ask Richard to talk about before Vietnam, because one of the things I didn't know um, about Richard until I asked him to do a piece about um, Lincoln Square and Lincoln Center for a history book um, that we did via the Durst Collection some years ago here at Columbia was Richard as a student. And everybody submitted these very, um, you know, kind of serious pieces about housing and the grid and, you know, very academic and um, terrific. Um, but, <laughs> but Richard submits this deeply personal um, take on what happened during those years when the battle for Lincoln Center was evolving, and I'm sure most of you know what was going on. And the reason I kind of wanted to fill in that piece of Richard is because, I mean, you're so many things. You are, like most other faculty here, an intellectual. But I think what makes you so interesting is, is your humility and your humor and your ability to kind of just be yourself through this all. And so when I read this piece about the very young Richard, I was so fascinated by it because it told me so much about what would come through in all the rest of those um, comments that are in the books and those situations. And I thought maybe you just wanted to share a little bit about that part of your life. That yeah, you can. Might not know. You can read this thing in the book. It's pretty good, I thought. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but we hated Lincoln Center, hated it. And. And I was a student, and I had some friends, and we worked in an office in the summers. That's when I decided I didn't want to work in an office. You know, when I graduated, I, had, <laughs> you know, I figured let's do, try something else here. Sure. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, one of my friends, was at Yale and had they were they were a bunch of students at Yale art um, music students. Actually, I studied violin for nine years, and my my mother was quite, you know, not well known or anything, but quite accomplished pianist and vocalist, and, and music was very important. And um, uh, when they, all right, Penn Station was one thing, but when they ripped down uh, the old Metropolitan Opera, that was too much. And we went. I remember. Well, I wrote about. It. We went the the week before um, uh, they they ripped it down. One of the last performances. I remember paying like fifty cents. You could. I was way up in the top. You couldn't see anything, but the the acoustics were great, much better than now. Um, and listen to that. I forget what it was. I remembered the opera missing. Anyway, what's his name from Brooklyn? Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, that was quite a while ago. And, and uh, the criminal, it seemed the criminality of that, you know. There was nothing wrong with the auditorium. It could have had the backstage rebuilt because new, you know, it was built in 1890s, I think. Um, it was pure politics. It was Moses. It was... Um, the idea that if they, they needed the opera in Lincoln Center for legitimacy, right? But the problem was if there was this other house down Broadway, it was at 39th Street, um, people would go down there and there would be another opera company. <laughs> so they knew that very well and, that, and that's how that thing came down. It was completely bizarre and, and actually criminal. Um, so that uh, that got me started on a whole bunch of things. Um, 
into the 80s, I would say. And, and I never separated out postmodernism and all of that from that kind of trajectory, right? And I, I would have to think more about that. Um, I just want to make one other comment, and then I'll hand okay. it over to Adam. Sorry, I, I care. No, 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 it's OK. I, I, op I opened up um, <laughs> that, that opportunity. You slid in. Um, I, is, I, I found myself reading some of the comments that you made um, a long time ago and thinking about how relevant they were still to the profession and to the world we live in. I was absolutely floored by some of them, which is when I took my pen and started circling them, because I started thinking, how much has changed and how much hasn't changed, both in terms of the profession, its relevance, its ability to reach out to the rest of the world, and also in terms of our world. And starting with Vietnam at this moment in time is such an interesting place, given what's going on with universities wow. and yeah. everything else. So uh, you know that probably was not in your mind at the time you were thinking about it, but it really made me think about where are we on that trajectory, and are we moving in a circle, or are we moving forward? So. Really yeah, I mean, uh, our students now, I don't know how many current students are here, but I, I, I've thought about this recently and whether the experience of this moment will be, at least for some students, as they were for some of us, so, so profound. And, um, you know, uh, so that's, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't have an answer for it except... Um, we were at a moment. We were at a moment in 68, oh well. I mean, the cities were burning. You have to remember that, too. I mean, there, things were happening. So, and we had to absorb it all as like 20, young 20-somethings, 20 uh, which was tough. Um, but Adam, you're a victim of two Caracas studios, what do you? <laughs> I was ready for a third. Um, that was amazing. I think I may be your only student up here. Um, and we saw a lot of maps. Actually, it would be one map that I would love to see um, is a kind of map that shows the spatial distribution of your students over time. It would be amazing. But also to see a drawing of that that um, creates the kind of intellectual connections between them. One of the things I loved about your book was um, seeing the notes that had the names of the students in the studio. Yes, and, yeah, that was great. And how many of them, the ones that at least stuck around New York, that I was able to place you know, actually beyond my peers or people older than me. There was one studio that you had which um, three very different people, all uh, imagining them as 20-year-olds in your studio. Um, you probably know them, Meta Prunzema, oh, and um, Henry Erbach, Henry, yeah. and, and uh, Joel Towers, Joel. all in one yeah. studio. And I was thinking, God, what a, what a crazy bunch that must have been. Um, but that was, to, that was Barcelona. OK, OK. okay. okay. Um, but to imagine uh, what that map would look like, to me, it made me think about the nature of connection and adjacency and actually a theme in your book, which is propinquity. And you know, what, um, what creates connection and adjacency and propinquity? And I think where you land is quite interesting. And it, I'm, in some ways, I'm starting with the end of the book, which speaks to Leuven and where you talk about that as such an interesting example of a place that kind of bypassed modernism and that they you know, destroyed. He tells this story. You'll have to read it. Um, uh, Leuven in Belgium destroyed in the First World War. Uh, and they rebuilt the medieval core. And it's a really beautiful moment in the book where you talk about that actually you know, back 100 years ago, there was this example of what cities uh, want today and need today, and how it was uh, something that completely bypassed what we saw throughout modernism, which, to me, one of the kind of um, most nerve-wracking essays by a planner was, was called Community Without Propinquity, Melvin Weber. Oh, well, yeah. And he... 
There's a lot to hate there. Um, but, there but it raises that question again, where you um, are taking a position about what a city should be and what propinquity is, which is more tied to a walkable city that creates connections. Now you do, you do something a little bit sneaky where you talk about spatial and intellectual propinquity, like that as the kind of mythical ideal, which is different than just imagining a place that has a dense urban fabric. So that, I wanna come back to that and ask you that, that question because it seemed to me, and it links to uh, you know, the history of the city in Syria that you cite with the Paul Vena uh, essay, um, but I think that's quite interesting and, and whether you are holding out a kind of ideal uh, for a city and what, what that looks like and how it performs. And so uh, it's, it's interesting to come back to. Um, one other thing that I wanted to just talk about in reading the book that I really loved was um, the snapshots in time, assuming that you didn't go back and tweak anything. And to me, it, it felt, and, and it was a little bit like, um, I don't know if anybody saw the movie uh, Boyhood by Richard, Richard Linklater. And he shoots the film over 20 some odd years. And what's amazing about the movie is that there are these scenes where you think, oh wow, he's wearing those sneakers, or he's got that t like was that t-shirt really from that year? And and so there were all of these moments with reading your essays where they were jarring, where it's like, wow, were people really saying that in 1970? So to contextualize the little argument, I'm actually going to come to your defense, because in the very first essay, uh, Richard uses the term neoliberal, which. Um, I went down a wormhole. You probably went down some wormholes. It is a term that um, was, it was not a pejorative, but it was in circulation among what we would call neoliberal economists today, Milton Friedman and folks like that. But what is amazing about it is that you are capturing these things in your essay that I was thinking, were people really thinking that in 1970? You wrote about gentrification at a really early date. And, and so that was a real pleasure to read, but also made me uh, feel like you were you know, pretty intellectually active and engaged with what was happening and really ahead of the curve in so many ways. So um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you so for that. That second neoliberal reference is legit. This, <laughs> yes, I, 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 you know, I, now the other thing I don't know, but, um, but I think, see, your studio and, and uh, Ignacio and Alessandro were also involved with those. Anybody else with Caracas? I don't remember. No. Um, they were very important to me because I started to think, as I did in Leuven, about, well, why was the largest reconstruction project in Europe at that time never discussed by historians? That's where I get. I get you know off on the history question. Uh, in the Caracas case, you have a city that it's probably um, ninety percent, eighty percent. I don't know, so-called informal, right? Mm -hmm. And what's that? I mean, it's actually, and and that's where I started to think about this formality question, because um, that's our perspective. <laughs> It's not informal, it's formal. It's just a whole different set of rules, right? And different outcomes. So I thought, so, so that studio was very important. I mean, all these studios, I learned a lot, I have to say, probably more than students. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, hopefully not. I mean, <laughs> Maybe it's a good moment to open it to the yes, yes. In audience, right? So I, I don't know if there's a mic to pass, uh, yeah. Yeah. but who was the, yeah. Um, I'm George Miller, and I was fortunate enough to be with Richard at Penn State marching against the war at that time. <laughs> you were in that? I yeah. was in that. Um, you know, for me, uh, what hasn't really been said so far is the influence that Richard and his investigations have had on the lives of so many. And for me, as a student, I, I grew up in a town of about 5,000 people in northeastern Pennsylvania. 
And with the investigations that we did, uh, and we heard about Manchu and we heard about uh, other projects that Richard was doing, but have the opportunity to go to Italy, which is, you know, the gateway to the world, and, and really grow and see uh, places that are of importance to architects was really special for me. Uh, and I think the other thing is that the relationships that you build with people. Richard showed uh, some slides of uh, an event that was just held a short time ago. People that we met 50 years ago, and we know their families and their grandkids, and uh, it really means a lot, the personal connection that you can have with people and the way you see the world. That's, that's a, an overlay of all of this kind of study that we were doing, which I think was important. And uh, I simply want to say that uh, it's time probably to talk about the future also. I mean, I, I really enjoy uh, these kind of stories from yesterday. But, you know, we've got some pretty serious challenges in front of us right now. And uh, not only in this city, but look what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, how we can provide, you know, housing and in places of, uh, of, you know, for people to kind of go about their lives day to day is really something that needs to be uh, addressed again. I think that the study abroad programs, not only here, but also across the country, need to be reinforced because it connects people, it connects ideas, it connects places, and it's important. So what's that, what's that song somebody said, don't stop thinking about tomorrow? I guess that's a few years ago too, but <laughs> you all remember that guy. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think one thing I would say, one thing about yeah. San Leocho was that that event last fall was extremely empowering because the community, of course, is, you know, is, uh, people are passing away and all that and moving away and all that, but they're struggling against, you know, huge economic forces to, for development. It is a UNESCO site now, but, the, you know, so, so that event was, um, and it surprised me, that very important that they could get together. And I guess we were the catalyst. I mean, we're the excuse um, for doing that 50 years later. Well, the, the other thing that I would say, and I, I really applaud you for your continuity and focus on, on the issues of housing and the importance it is uh, worldwide. I mean, somebody said how many, how many families are without housing today, it's, uh, it's really critical that we all do what we can to focus on that. So it's almost worthy of marching in the streets again, isn't it? Yeah. Austin. Yeah. I see we have many of the usual suspects here. <laughs> Sorry. Including Austin. <laughs> I don't really have a question. Um, I just wanted to say this, because uh, there's been a lot of talk about continuity uh, and this kind of amazing sort of uh, train of thought that's just been rigorously upheld over the course of the, this you know, five decades of, of thinking. Um, and all of that is absolutely true. But to go back to Adam's point about propinquity, and since George is here, I'll, I'll mention, you know, my old boss, Harry Cobb, used to, used to talk about the architecture of contingency, right, and the Jason. So, so in, the, in, in, the, in the context of pedagogy, that, that contingency, I just want to say, Richard, you know, when, when we were in your studios, and also when you hired my first teaching job, <laughs> when you brought me on to the Puerto Plata project, you know, when I saw it sort of from the, from the other side, there was this, um, there was that, there, there was that arc, you know, of thought that we, we felt privileged to be a part of, but there was also this incredible attention to what the students themselves were interested, the contingency of individual imagination and individual sort of projection and, 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 and sort of your willingness and generosity to dive into our weird, sometimes totally irrelevant, you know, um, uh, uh, investigations. And, and you were just sort of right there with us. I mean, you know, you showed that photograph of, of Harkov and, and like that was that for, for as a student, you know, to like get to engage on a project where we were, you know, talking about oligarchs and, and gas and, you know, like 
and 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 not really showing any design. <laughs> you know? And you were just you were just incredibly um, supportive of our uh, of our of, of of sometimes our refusal to participate and also our um, our our wild deviation. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for for that generosity, that 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 attention to contingency and propinquity um, pedagogically. It, it, I, it, it taught me personally sort of how to think and, and, and claim agency um, uh, as a designer, and, and I, I, just have, I just have you to, to thank for that. Well, thank you. I mean, I learned from you guys. Uh, actually, the, the advantage of the soft science side is exactly this kind of diversity. <laughs> You know, and it's a huge advantage, not that you don't need both hard and soft, but you know, yeah, that's, the studios are an amazing instrument. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I've had like almost half, half the, yeah, yeah, because about half the dais as uh, professors when I was a student here. Um, and yeah, I think one thing that I found really interesting about all the conversations today was um, in reflecting on the like long legacy of these studios where you did have students from multiple different programs and kind of like encourage this, this de-siloing that um, is common at a lot of schools and I think is still always an ongoing challenge. Um, please bring back the cafe and brownies. Current students, these problems, like you said about the future, you know, like current students at GSAP are gonna be writing things like this in the future, are gonna be solving these problems. And so I think it's incredible to have this faculty up here that have such a legacy of talking about these things and doing these things. Um, so I think it's, it's very encouraging. Um, to speak on that and speak, kind of bring us back to this question of housing and of the future, you know, we're right now in the midst of the biggest upheaval in zoning in New York City in, what, 60 years? Uh, most of it around housing. Um, probably not with the amount of actual critical thinking that needs to be going into it. Um, at the same time, a lot of city agencies, folks in them uh, kind of ground up are talking about shifting the culture in city, uh, in zoning and in city agencies to one where housing, planning, design is looked at as a um, as a health question, as a public health question, right? Housing is not an architectural problem, it's a public health problem. And, you know, I am kind of curious on your thoughts on like, what are the future conversations? What are the current conversations, you know, that, that can connect this, this sort of uh, path that you've drawn into the next phase of studios, the next phase of courses, and the next generation of uh, architects, planners, activists, et cetera. Oh man! <laughs> what should I write my dissertation on so I can yeah, get a job? Yeah, yeah, you tell me. I mean, I, I don't know. I think there was an interesting article in the Times today about Paris and the fact that the majority of uh, housing units in Paris are somehow government-owned uh, or, or certainly subsidized, and um, because housing is a basic human right, and that's something that we have never gotten straight in this country, I'm afraid. I mean, you, you're the expert, actually, on how things get done. I mean, I, well, it's very interesting to, to, to work with, to, to listen to uh, Ignacio and Alessandro's conversations in their office maybe Naira, I mean, our subsidy system is so screwed up that it's impossible to understand how, how things will proceed without a major overhaul, but it, it's certainly the way things are going with our politics doesn't seem, I mean, this requires major, major noise to get things straightened out. I, it's a big concern. All I did was write history, sort of, kind of hit. And that was, that's an interesting story, too. I mean, when I, when I did the book in 19, by 1990, I wanted to do a book that wasn't about architecture because I thought the architecture books, you know, in a couple of years they disappear, you know, they're less like 
somebody does a book and okay, fine. Um, they get a review and that's the end of it. I, I want to do a book that would be useful for a long time and that wouldn't be the normal sort of architecture book. And it would be about housing because it would be, it'd be you know, more than just the designs, right? And, and one of the things that I have found very interesting is that it actually has been that. I mean, I, get, I think people still use it, from what I hear. <laughs> is part of that or, the syntactic structure? <laughs> the removal of color, the black and white? The, uh, it could be. That's but I don't mean, I don't mean that at all, super. <laughs> no, but the, I mean, th throughout your talk, you, you came around to syntax, and I was thinking of everything from Susan Sontag to Noam Chomsky, but like an era where linguistics was, and the way Peter Eisenman used linguistics or uh, Mario Gondosonos. Venturi, Scott Brown, but that part of it allowed it to be transmissible or, and the digitization project, which turned out to be your thesis, I guess. Well, no, but that was But this project of basically that. making it transmissible through some sort of syntactic focus. Well, the black and white thing is, I could say more about, a little more about that. Um, I think you're right. See, the interesting thing about this book is when I, when I gave it to uh, Ramon Pratt, you know, at Actar, you know, he's a great guy, he's been doing this for years, I don't know how he keeps going, but his, all his books are all these colorful things, I mean, it's like, God, you know, and, and some are way too thick or way too thin, I don't know what they are, you know, so he seriously asked me, he said, but is black and white an ideological problem for you? <laughs> and I said, yes, Ramon. <laughs> I remember that phone call. <laughs> he couldn't believe it, because it's the, probably the only book in his whole list <laughs> It's only black and white. But I thought, well, let's not distract here from the message, right? I mean, let's not have noise, let's, even for this, but for the, yeah, for the, 1990 book, yeah, I think you're right. That's what it was. Um, I think that's why the course remained appealing. People wanted to still experiment with trying to. Yeah. To, to I see mean, you if, said to test those. the viability of that. It yeah. wasn't a, it wasn't necessarily a wholesale endorsement, but it was definitely a desire to test that. Yeah. And anybody that went to the reviews in the last. Yeah, you said on the. Uh, yeah, no, I was always yeah. curious there myself, keep wanting to. You See, were curious, we, why do they do this? You know, this <laughs> how do you? This is the disarming plunge humor. It's, if, you, if you try to make him the center of attention, he will make himself the periphery very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he's in the middle right now. Maybe there's a Just for efficiency's Ooh, sake. Who was in the book? Yeah, Mexico City. Um, I want to reflect on the pedagogy piece and, and maybe. Maybe it's fundamental today, but I do believe the way in which the studios force collaboration is such an important uh, thing that I got out of this, uh, a professionalism yeah. that was cultivated within three semesters, right? I mean, if you didn't like your team, you had to for three semesters. So I've gotten so much, uh, I mean, sure, it was a graduate educational experience, but there was a degree of professional training that we were being prepared for. And I think having to reflect on that is really an impressive thing in which you know, you immediately apply that in the office, right? At least from my um, experience. And to get architects to collaborate. Well, it was really great we had that kind of experience in an academic context where we could explore theory. Uh, different from, well, at least from my experience, very different from uh, practicing in the real world. and then interjecting theoretical ideas uh, to be delivered. And I just want to thank you for, you know, really uh, working succinctly and with other creative 
faculty to put that kind of programming together. Well, that was the idea, but you should think that the UD faculty that are here, they were on the front lines of this, and they, like Kaya now, and I, I don't know, Justin, and, and uh, who else is it, David, Gita, yeah. I mean, they, they had to enforce the, that idea, and it, it wasn't, I think summer was the most difficult moment. Then the students kind of, <laughs> <laughs> students then kind of got <laughs> into uh, yeah, Gita, you know. I want to pick up on what you said, because Richard, you, it's been such an honor to teach with you, but you've been able to look into the future, right? And think about what things are gonna be important. Now is a very special moment in time, in history. And yes, I think everyone's teaching whatever they are teaching, plus climate risks and all. But what about what's happening in politics and whole cities and countries being destroyed? How should we think of that? And how should that uh, you know, impact what we teach? I should say something about this. <laughs> I'll say one thing. I think we're, uh, there's, Learning has to become even more intense because we actually don't know exactly what we're doing, which is good and bad. But I, I'm thinking, like thinking back to um, the Turkish project, right? I was, there was a, another faculty member, Michael Schwarting, I don't know if anybody remembers him. He, he was here and he had a connection in Todi in Italy uh, and there were, there was a whole like, like little circle of expats there, uh, uh, Beverly Pepper, the sculptress, and, uh, um, and, and the, the woman that taught it in Barnard, who wrote the fantastic book, Novak, Barbara Novak, on yeah. landscape and nature, landscape painting and nature. There, there was a little circle here, and, and um, so they, after San Leocho, they want me to do a studio in Todi, because it was this kind of group, and, Tody was, you know, you know, uh, somehow <coughs> trying to coalesce as a, com a new kind of community, but I had already committed to go to uh, Turkey, so fine. But now being sort of partially relocated in Tody, I understood how much I still don't understand about how cities work. I mean, that is a medieval city. That's before the Enlightenment. We're taught how fantastic is the enlightenment, the name itself. Uh, and for me, it's been an amazing experience to understand how that place works, because it's pretty intact. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a thousand years old fabric, right? Um, and, and, and I think learning from these places in a, in a kind of systematic way, but creative way, is very important um, in design schools. Absolutely, um, and how to do it is a question. I could never, I'm sure no one will ever do another 50-year um, studio <laughs> project, <laughs> you know, in any school. I mean, that was a moment of, um, of, of, of turmoil and intensity where you could actually grab something and do something with it, right? Um, but I think we have to find those occasions now. I mean, I'm just thinking, how, how, how should Harkiv be remade? Um, and we were thinking about post-Soviet city. Well, now, forget about, well, now it truly is post-Soviet, you know. Um, and, 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 and of course, Gaza, and oh my God. I mean, there's, I mean, I mean and I mentioned, of course, um, Syria, and uh, so, so it's a moment of huge opportunity if we could, if we can catch it. I did see opportunity and I tried to catch it, yeah. That, let's just say that. Now what I caught, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank, 
Thank you, Andres. It doesn't get better than this, right? I mean, this is... A... <laughs> <laughs>